The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. I hope you guys enjoy this talk and I really hope you comprehend it, listen to it and comprehend it. It's not going to fit what people normally talk about. It is not going to fit. I'm just telling you that right now. It's not going to be forced, not going to vindicate to anybody in their beliefs. It'll be for the edification of God's truth that he gave to Christ Jesus. It's not going to be for support of anybody's doctrine, just so you understand that. But I do hope it gives you food for thought. I hope it causes you to go back to the Word of God to see some things you didn't see before. I hope it increases the value of your relationship with Christ because there's a problem with this divisive topic from the beginning. It causes anger. Nothing God gives is going to cause any visceral hatred or anger. Whatever God gives is going to grow our spirits. It's going to grow it in love, not hatred. It's going to grow it in unity, not division. It's going to grow us in his ways, not to be against the apple of his eye, not to be against his most precious creation, which is humanity. It's not going to support things outside of who he is. God is consistent as far as who he is. Now, some people, they don't worship the same God we do, because if your God is not connected to Christ Jesus, it is not the God that I worship. And if you serve a God where you have to go through anybody but Jesus, it is not the God we talk about here. Just so you know that. The God we talk about here is the one where we present prayers to Jesus Christ only. And they are presented to the Father by Christ. Because the Lord said, no one, no one goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. So if it's not going through Christ, not the God we talk about here. And if it's not going to Christ to be presented to the Father, it is not the God we believe in here, just so you know that. And all things were given to the Son. The Son is King of kings and Lord of lords. And the Son is the living word of God. As we stand for here, the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of AI, not the gospel of Joe Schmo, not the gospel of this church configuration over here or affiliation over here and this configuration which is this affiliation we don't do that we don't support the doctrines of the many doctrines that have formed over the years we don't support the doctrines that just popped up in the 1800s the doctrines that popped up in the 1700s and the doctrines that popped up in the 1500s we don't support those doctrines we don't talk about those doctrines because there's no need to we have the gospel period so I'll say it again, it's not going to be the conversation you expect because it's not going to support nor vindicate anybody's preconceived notion. This is about Christ. This is about his gift of salvation. This is about him really coming back. He will come back for his own because he already said so. It's about our plight here on this earth and the truth of it and what's happening here on this earth according to the word. The gospel is by no means one person's interpretation and everybody believes that. I don't believe in that either. That's one of the issues with these sites that they have out there. A doctrinal statement is something that you believe, that you want others to believe in also, according to how they wrote it. I don't believe in any of that. I don't want a soul believing like I do. I desire that everybody believe authentically, as God gave them to believe, that not one of us can learn if all of us believe in the other person. I don't believe in people. I believe in the Most High. I don't believe in a thing or an event. How many of you believe in the flood? What would you say? I don't believe in the flood. I know the flood happened, but I don't believe in it. To believe in something means you're following it. Why would I believe in the flood? I believe that the flood happened, just like the Bible states. But I don't believe in it. The flood is not my savior. I hope you guys got the flood's not my savior. I've heard people come up and they say, well, you know, they've asked each other, do you believe in the pre-trib? And the person will say, well, no, not really. Well, then you're just awful. I don't believe in a thing. I believe in Christ. And to give you a hint about something, I'm not concerned. There are some genuine reasons I follow Christ. It is not to escape anything here on this earth. I do not follow Christ so he can come and swoop me up before trouble begins. That is not why I follow him. That is, I will never follow anybody like that. Can you imagine in your lives? If, in fact, you had, you all of you have had this example. Hopefully you'll begin to think differently when I bring this about, but how many of you would be hurt 
if you had a friend who was only your friend to get something out of you. And when they found out they could not get something out of you that they really wanted, they were no longer your friend. How many of you were ever hurt by a situation like that? How many of you ever had somebody who attached themselves to you, smiled at you, agreed with you because they thought they could get something out of you? And the moment they found out they couldn't get something out of you, they turned their backs. How many have gone through that? Well, let me ask you this. What do you think the Lord perceives of people who follow him only so they can escape out of trouble? Who are constantly talking about a time that Jesus is coming to get them and that's the reason they follow him. Because if somebody ever says, well, he's not coming to get you out of this trouble, they get instantly upset as though it's the entire reason they're following Christ. How do you think that would be perceived of our Lord? What do you think that would do to the heart of our Lord? How is that actually perceived? Because if a person gets upset because another person does not believe that the Lord will get them prior to a certain trouble, isn't that truly because they have a hope to escape everything on earth and so they're acting good so they can escape it because i've seen this process also when a person starts to believe the contrary they say what's the use in doing all this good when i'm going to have to suffer anyway what's the good of it do you see the motive if that's a person's motive and the lord can see the truth then what's really happening what are people really doing because I know if somebody said, Mike, you know, if, if I had some troopers that said, Mike, you know, I'm going to follow you because I know you're going to, I, I just know you're going to give a sleeve right after this mission. And so they follow me for that. And then in the middle of a situation, I said, well, guys, you can't have leave and all loyalty is lost. What kind of a group would that be? But this is what people are doing. And because they don't want their own dreams crushed. Because they still, they're, they're doing right to escape something. They're still running away from things. They're frightened of the, of, of the notion that somehow they may have to stay and find themselves in trouble. I got news for them. They began in trouble. They continued in trouble. Their whole life has been tribulation. Jesus was very specific, but people are dreaming of, let me tell you something here, because this is his story. There are certain men in history that have come up with these theories, spoke about these theories. And not that they were unsound, but they were based and building the motivation of those that followed them. Now that's real information that is already documented on the internet that you guys can actually see for yourselves and see why they began this. Because if you belong to Christ, why should that matter? Are we trusting Christ? Are we trying to get something out of him? Because if you trust Christ, you're not going to be concerned about what he's coming to get you. You're going to be concerned about what he desires of you today. You have a lot of folks who are doing what is required so they can be saved. And if I'm not mistaken, then that means they're doing everything to save themselves. Because if a person does not share what I believe about Christ, but they believe in Christ, do you not know my arms and heart is still open to them? Do you know why? Because they believe in Christ. If I just shut that off, because they did not believe in a way that I believed. Isn't that human emotion? Isn't that the flesh? Isn't that the way mankind without Christ operates? If they don't get what they want, they throw a tantrum. They lash out. How long will people tolerate this type of situation or hatred, dysfunctional relationship in their own life? And if you trust Christ, why would anybody question what he decides if he said, he, if he's my savior, if I call him my savior, why would I be worried about not being saved? Why would my mind ever be on not being saved? If he's my savior, if I call him my savior, if I've accepted him on the cross, why would I then second guess him as though he's not going to fulfill what he said he would fulfill? The Lord specifically told us that we would have trials and tribulations. But one of the biggest factors is, People run from sufferings. Do you know why they run from sufferings? Because at some point in their life they have suffered and they're frightened of it. In order to overcome that fright, you've got to trust your Savior. You've got to see to accept the Savior is to accept what he said. You cannot accept the sacrifice, yet not believe what the sacrifice was for. 
Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. You know what Jesus said? He said, I have power to lay my life down and to take it up again. You know, Jesus said that from his own mouth. Do you know that? So because he was obedient to the Father, because he was the word of God, it's impossible he did not know God's mind. That's impossible. Your mouth is going to speak what's in your mind. It's impossible that you can think something and it not work through the rest of your body. Because what you think and what you agree with becomes a matter of the heart. And when the heart goes forward, action comes out of the body. In our case, it comes by way of speech and some physical action. But with the Lord, it comes out through his word, which is Christ. It's impossible that Christ was blind to the very heart of the Father, to his thoughts. So since that is the case, since that is the case, when the word was sacrificed, taking your place, when the word promised you, that it would deliver you if you believed, that you would truly be redeemed if you believe. Why then would we second guess him? That's not accepting the Christ. That's not accepting the cross or Christ. You can't accept that sacrifice and not believe in what that sacrifice was for. You cannot accept Christ if you don't know what that sacrifice is for. If you don't know what trials and tribulations are for because they are part of of the cross and then to second guess that what are we doing i'll tell you what that is that is a darkness kind of like that flat earth theory these divisive subjects are working within christianity see he cannot come to you directly but he can come to you by way of your mind weaponizing information to turn one against the other causing us to be less genuine confusing a lot of folks and it's about to get a whole lot worse a whole lot worse. How many are offended when somebody says they don't believe in the rapture? It's okay. You can say it here. Because I know that most people who believe in the rapture, if they're not highly mature, meaning you're not a bishop or somebody like that, in most cases you'll get offended. When somebody says they don't believe, you'll get offended because you have a great hope tied to it. Right? There's hope behind it. Let's go ahead and face it. There's a lot of hope connected with the rapture. Right? It is an assurance for a lot of people. In other words, when things get bad in your life, you can always think to that time when the Lord said he would come and get you, and it can actually grant you hope. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. Do you know why? We don't know when that time is, but we do know what the Word says, that there will come a time when those who are alive will be called up with him in the air. We know that time is coming. There's no problem with that. Not, there's no problem with that at all. And you'd be shocked at some of the scriptures surrounding that. The problem is the subject has changed into something else. The subject has been taken out of the word of God and has become a subject all its own. It has become a doctrine all its own. When anybody takes something out of the word of God and then they make it a doctrine and ask me, do I believe in it? My answer is a flat no, because it's out of context, because it has taken on a life of its own. I don't subscribe to that. You know why? Because I'll never think about that. I will never think about escape. I will never think about running. Do you know I never think about running to escape anything? I believe in facing things head on. And do you not know that the Lord teaches us to face everything head on? Never to run. To walk through? Yes. But never to run. There's no need to run. Because when it comes to you, nothing is by chance. Your situations are not coincidences. Your situations, Satan does not have the upper hand. He has to have permission to do things in your life. And what you may be doing is looking at individuals in the world of whom Satan already has, and then he becomes brutal, and it scares you into believing that somehow that can happen to you. All of you are here right now, and it has never happened to you because you have chosen to accept the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Now he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You have chosen to accept his gospel. That's what you chose. And because you chose that, you are not to be touched. You are to be raised. See, there's a difference. Everything that happens to you raises you. And some of you have had some bad parents. They're very hateful. They can be very cruel. They act like teenagers at most. They have many vices, things that happen in the world. Many of them drink and do things, and it's out of control. 
and they end up abusing the children or being absent from the child totally. Many of you had childhoods like that. You just, you didn't know why. You asked the Lord, why did this happen to me? You see other children with their parents, and your parent was not there, and it broke your heart, and it left a stain on your mind and in your heart, and it caused you to become this very protected person. You're frightened and even angry about opening up because you know that people take advantage of things. This is how you see life because of what happened in your life, because you had a bad parent or parents. But did you ever stop to see what actually happened? When you want to know something in the world, God gave you an ability to see the whole thing. Never accept the darkness that you see in life. Never accept that as being the definition. Always seek the light. And then, with the light and the darkness, you have the truth. You do not have the truth unless you have both sides. It is not the truth to believe that Jesus will only allow the good in your life and you not so much as stub a toe. That's not the truth. The truth is addiction, alcoholism, pornography, different things like that. You know what it's like. And do you know what happened when you saw the truth? Do you know what happened? You made a choice. After seeing the darkness and the light of a situation, you made a choice. But you had to see both sides. Both sides. And that takes you to become a part of that darkness in a lot of ways and to see the light. That's when you made a choice. You cannot make a choice if all you see is one side. Everybody understand that? If you woke up and it was always nighttime, you can never decide to dwell in the day. It's that simple. If you lived in the daytime, you can never decide to take a peek at the night. If there was no night, you cannot make a choice to go wander around in the night to go investigate. You can't do that. You have to know both sides to make a choice. You had to see darkness and light. Your whole life has been that way. Your whole life has been an introduction of the darkness and the light. Look carefully into your life and you'll see it. When you were young, many of you were born into a dark situation. And then you saw the light and you chose internally that you would never replicate the darkness you were part of. But only after seeing both sides. Some people, before they see the light, they're convinced all there is is darkness. And those are individuals who stay in corrupted situations because they have not been presented the light of it yet or the truth of it yet, the righteousness of it yet. And once you see both the light and the darkness of a situation, you end up making a choice. The truth is darkness and light. The truth is both sides, not one side. Do you all see that? That's the truth. It's like my personal friends that are close. I don't have any personal friends, and all I know is the good of them. In order to know the truth, you have to see both darkness and light. Second part is understanding the truth. How would a person understand the truth if they have no experience with the elements of truth? Well, to understand the truth, you have to go through situations where you're actually either captured by darkness or held captive by darkness or a partaker of darkness. And you have to have experience with light, being delivered from that darkness, experience in righteousness, goodness. Once you have that experience in both darkness and light you have understanding look carefully into your lives all of you have experience with darkness that's why you went through what you went through now each person has a degree of resiliency which means you're able to take more than the other person so everybody has a different level of darkness and light they are exposed to some of you are quite you have attributes for example if some of you have to lead others in the face of all odds, you have to go through quite a bit. You're going to have to know darkness in a very deep way. So what does the Lord do? Before you were ever born, if you belonged to him, he would carefully manage the darkness you would see. Now, for many of you, he put you in darkness early in your life. Early. How many put you in darkness early in your life? Based upon who you are, you went through a situation. That darkness you went through, as soon as you got at the heart of that darkness because you went through phases what did you find out that you don't like it 
You don't like that darkness. See, if God hadn't put you through the level of darkness you went through, you could be in this world right now being a part of darkness and imposing that darkness upon somebody else. But because it did not let up and you went pretty deep and that bad things happened, you said, I don't want this. You said, this is a bad thing for everybody and I don't want anybody else to go through this. The Lord had to get you to the point where you would actually identify or not identify with that darkness. To do that, you have to comprehend it. Then, in accordance to who you are, he showed you righteousness at certain levels. Now, if you have to lead people, again, if you have to lead people, he's going to expose you to a righteousness that will increase your faith so that you will have hope in him as you lead other people, which means you're not going to be one of those who will give up. When God raises a leader, those leaders do not give up. In order for you to have that inside of you, that you will not give up, that means you're going to have experience in deliverance in areas that are impossible. You have to go through that impossible situation and be delivered from it. You have to see darkness at a depth that hardly anybody else can see so that you can say no human being belongs to that darkness. So that means you have to see the truth of it. And as you walk in this life according to how you're called, every step you take, everybody in the world can say, they could say to you right now to your face, that, you know, that darkness isn't so bad, and you will beg to differ no matter what evidence comes out. Everybody around you can stop believing in Christ and present evidence against Christ, and you will walk by faith. You won't be touched. That's according to you all. So all of you have been immersed in situations based on who you are. Search your life. You'll see it. You had to have understanding of this. Once you have the truth, once you have understanding of the elements of that truth, now you can make a choice. Right now in your life, many of you are making choices. Not just one, but many choices. You're taking all of your learned experiences. You're starting to see something. One of the first things that happens, which is why I never get into conversations with people or, or let's just say little fights about their opinion of another person. Here's why. When you immerse from God's raising you, having you go through darkness and light, the first thing you're going to do is start to see situations all around you that have that specific darkness and light in them, which is going to form your opinion about a person's situation. Here's how that works. You may look at someone and say, well, this person, they must have been exposed to so-and-so because look how they're acting. How would a person ever say that? How could a person look at another person and say they must have been an alcoholic? Because uh, you see how they're acting? That's how an alcoholic acts after they're trying to, you know, get away from it. So they may not have it all there right now, but given time, they'll recover. Now, only a person who has been delivered from alcohol, who has gone through all that, all those different addiction steps would know that. Everybody else is, they're not going to understand. So you're going to have a certain opinion of people based on what you see. And what you see of them is going to be based on what God gave you experience with, what he gave you truth and understanding of, right? So everybody's opinion is going to be different based upon how they see the individual. And how they see the individual is going to be based on the truth and understanding they have had in their own lives, which means everybody is going to see everybody differently. That's why. I never get in the back and forth over who somebody else is because all of us are going to see a bit different than the other person. Why do we do this? Because all of us have had a taste of a specific type of darkness. All of us have had a taste of a specific level of God's righteousness. And based upon those two things, when we understand them, we're going to start to see this in other people. It's going to form an opinion. Those opinions are going to be different. They're going to be very different. But that should never escalate into an argument between two Christians, although it does sometimes. Now, with those two elements, having truth and understanding, you make a choice. And that choice is when you, ironically, when you start having advice for everybody else. That's how it naturally works. Not for yourself, but for everybody else. See, internally, you've made a choice. You have not walked that choice totally out yet. But you made a choice. And then you start looking at other people and you can identify certain aspects of their life or what they must may be going through. And you'll say they need to make a choice. They need to make up their minds, right? This ultimately will lead you to a choice. Well, God has a way of opening your eyes to many different people. He does this by way of relationships. Not one soul that's ever come into your life was by accident. Not one soul. 
See, because while you were being given truth and understanding in your situation that you would have experience enough to make a choice, he put somebody else through that same thing. Now, their final elements of refinery that everybody goes through because that righteousness that you have, it's going to grow. So then somebody else who's come from a different walk of life, they begin to share their experiences with yours, things that you did not go through. You can now pick up without having to go through them. How is that possible? Because as you have a relationship, whether that relationship be good or bad, when you have that relationship, you start to pick up aspects of the other person's life. There's one thing people can't help to do when they get together. You want to know what that is? They start sharing what they've gone through. They can't help it. They are eventually going to have that conversation of what they went through. They're going to explain their actions. In fact, most people get in a relationship and they'll do certain things on purpose and say, I hope this person understands what I've gone through. Didn't that echo in your minds? You never knew why. Why would you want somebody who just walked into your life to understand your background that you never told them? Why would that be a desire inside of a person's mind as soon as they get in a relationship? Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? You want them to really understand it. Do you know why in a relationship? First, you meet the person on the outside. Then you get to know the person on the inside, which often contradicts what's on the outside. And then once you get to you don't understand me. I'm doing this because you don't understand me. You don't know why I did it. Now, I want you to know why I did it. So we have truth. We have understanding and all of that to make a choice. All of that to make a choice. That choice you make, the choice you make after having experience with darkness and light, having relationships with people when you are raised and then another person can contribute to the righteousness that you have by the sharing of their information, of their lives. All that builds. It builds and it builds and it builds until at some point you make a final choice. Now, when you make your first choice, that's normally when a person says, yes, you know, I don't, I don't want to deal with darkness. Hear me on this. Many people at first, when they make their first choice, they don't want to deal with the darkness because of the consequences, the negativity it carries. But as soon as you make a choice and you accept Christ, how many of you understand and comprehend that's when you're lured into higher levels of dark things, dark things you never did prior to accepting Christ. That's when the temptation really comes. That's when you are really working through these life experiences. And they seem to be quite costly. That's when you have to endure the repercussions of quite a few things. Righteousness is just as equal. Do you know that? For every hour of darkness that you've had in your life, you're going to have times in righteousness. Do you know that? Do you know that all of it is to raise you? All of it is to qualify your choice. Most often we make choices, but normally when we make a choice, we often go against that choice we made. We make a choice based on intention, right? We mean well. But we find ourselves not having the wherewithal or the ability or the stamina to stay within the confines of that choice. Do you all understand? It's if we make a choice for righteousness and we accept Christ, but then we find ourselves stumbling back into sin, that means you did not have the wherewithal. You did not have what you needed to stay within righteousness. And darkness lured you away. But don't worry, God does this on purpose as part of your process. Why? Because when you make a choice, your first choice, nobody can ever tell you that you made a mistake. Nobody. You're quite bold in that statement. You're full of intention, but you do not understand the depth of your enemy. You don't really comprehend all the mechanisms of your own soul. So the Lord gently walks you through every area of your own soul. And it begins to exercise portions of your soul you never thought possible. You may not comprehend fully right now. In other words, when you say yes to Christ, having made a choice because you have the truth, you have understanding, you made your choice, and now you're a Christian having Christ, now it's time for you to grow spiritually. It's time for you to become who you are to become. These first three, the first three, that simply identifies your base intention or your heart's intention. Your heart's intention is to be a person of righteousness. But the reality behind it is you don't yet have the strength 
to continually say yes. See, when a person says, I, I you know, I, I fell back into sin, what that really means is you did not have the strength to continue to say yes. At some point, you said no to righteousness. You see how that works? And so the Lord qualifies us this way because he'll have us in a situation and expose to us that yes, there are elements in me that will still choose darkness. That's when you fall back into sin. That's when you say yes to sin. And the Lord knows it, but he has to expose it. And every time he does this, guess what happens to you? You are humbled. See, at the beginning, you're bragging. I'm not going into that sin, and you shouldn't go into that sin, and this, that, and the other, right? That's what we do. And then the Lord shows us that we're still vulnerable to darkness, that we would still choose darkness. Even when we accepted Christ, we'll still choose darkness. And then we're humbled. Because uh, have you noticed that the longer you deny that you fell, the worse it gets? Have you guys noticed that? If you deny that you faltered, and it was that you did it, if you deny that, it gets worse and worse and worse until you do admit it. Until you say to people, look, here it is. Here's what you get. This is what you get. I fell flat on my face. I chose the wrong thing because I still have areas in my life I have to work on. Until you say that, the situation gets worse and worse and worse until you do say that. Because once you say that, something else happens. Fall back into sin again. The whole point of that is for humility. You have to know what humility is. You have to know what being humble is. What the truth of it is. The truth of humility is not to act nice. That's not humility. That's false. When you act nice to somebody, that's, that's not humility. That's not. That's acting. The Lord's not saving a bunch of actors. That's not what he's doing. And for the most part, in the beginning, we do act. But then, once we fall into the very thing we criticized of everybody else, humility steps in. But then that's still a tough time. This is a trial within itself because we deny that it's our fault. And we always have someone to point to. But then one day, one day when our spirits are mature, one day when our choices are more refined, we finally say, no, I fell. And I don't want to fall again and I choose Christ. That's the moment you stop bragging on things you don't know about. Because the very thing you fell in is the very thing you bragged about that you wouldn't do. You fell and you're trying to hide it from everybody because you fell. Because you told everybody you would never fall in that area. Because you presented yourself strong in an area you were not tried in. You weren't tested in. And God calls that hypocrisy. And we know he looks down on hypocrisy. So he takes us being in our hypocrisy and he reforms us through humility. And once we surrender... Once we surrender what we presented to everybody else and we say, you know, I did fall. I did fall. That becomes your testimony. That becomes a big help to somebody else. Now, but we're growing with this now because once you do that, you've made a huge step. And here's how. Other people around you who love the Lord, an example of a person who loves the Lord, but they fell back into a situation and then they came right back to the Lord again. That helps people. That's real life. That's what we read of King David. That's what we, that's what we see of so many characters in the Bible, how they messed up, but how they came back to Christ. See, that makes it real, doesn't it? That makes it tangible. And it also helps another person to get back up themselves. Do you all see that? You're presented with the truth. Then you understand the elements of truth, which is darkness and light. Then you make a choice. Then you choose Christ. And then you find out you're not able to maintain your heart's intent. When you fall back into sin, you're humbled because now you have to admit that you fell back in sin. And when you deny it, it gets worse and worse until you admit it. Once you admit it, that you fell back into sin, that's when the Lord works through you to other people. That's when the Lord teaches us humility, not to present ourselves in a fake image like we're perfect. That's hypocrisy. The Lord teaches us truth humility and meekness in order to have those attributes you have to go through a couple things you have to go through the father's process the father's process is never to break a person down it is to have a person have the strength the wherewithal to stay within righteousness which is their heart's intent in the first place it's your heart's intent to stay within righteousness all too often we find out we don't have the strength to stay within righteousness yet we try to prop ourselves up. 
like we have stated in you know, righteousness to everybody else. God knows the truth. He knows the truth. And he's raising us. Do you all see that? So we've covered a lot of ground thus far about the beginning of your process, which is very important, getting up to the point where the Lord has bestowed humility upon you. Once you have humility, once you actually have that, now something happens and you're ready to share the real truth with somebody else. See, have you guys noticed that you cannot share the truth if it's not totally truthful? You can't share just the good thing and not mention the pitfalls and the bad decisions. Because the truth is, see, if somebody would have came to you and said, listen, you can accept Christ, yes. Now, but you, it's going to be, it's going to be tough because the Lord's going to train you and raise you to be real. A person wouldn't understand that, would they? Isn't it funny how through God's process, we have an understanding of these things, this mutual understanding of things, but only because we've gone through a process, correct? Once you have humility, you start looking into God's word, you look at the world a, a different way, and something happens. When you start choosing righteousness again, thing you see, once you choose that righteousness, then you're going to be trained to stand above darkness. You're going to be trained on that. Because at this point, God wants to give you the absolute spiritual truth. And he wants to arm you with that seal of truth. That seal of truth is by way of the Holy Spirit. In order to have that, even when you have humility, now he's going to have you join the family to be a true joint heir with Christ by what? Partaking in his sufferings. And a lot of people, they still don't know what that means. To partake in the sufferings of Christ. You know what that is? That is for you to be familiar with his walk, his rejection in his walk, how people spit on him in his walk, but how to keep a godly mindset and a godly heart and godly intent the entire time. In other words, he's going to make your relationship real. You cannot walk like that with a fake relationship. You can't. You can, you can act like you're walking like that, but it will eventually blow up in your face. No, your relationship is going to be real. And so God starts to pull the scales off of your eyes. And this is when the world changes. This is when things are very different. Prior to, prior to the time when it pulls the scales off your eyes, because a lot of people right now, they're in, their, they're in that stage of being humbled. They're in that stage. And why does humility count? Well, humility comes when you brag about being righteous. But in truth, you, you know you're still making bad decisions. You're still choosing darkness because you still have dark desires within you. Let's go ahead and face it. And so humility is when your situation breaks down and you're forced to admit it. By you confessing your true position, you now have stepped out of hypocrisy. See, if, if I am not doing too well, but I say everything is fine, God is blessing me, I have not a worry in the world, that's hypocritical. That's not the truth. How can righteousness work in a lie. It can't. Can it? It can't work. And indeed, that is a lie. God won't work in a lie. He's not going to work his truth in a lie. He's not going to do that. And so what the Lord has to do is rid us of these lies, that weakness. And he does that. That's when we have the failures. All these failures, even after choosing Christ, as soon as you choose Christ, it's almost like you have this period of bliss, and then everything is downhill. And let's go ahead and tell the truth. Everything changes. In fact, where you are now, you did not see yourself being here when you first started. When you first came to Christ, you did not see yourself where you are now. Because the Lord, listen, now here's the beautiful part. Because the Lord loves you and indeed did choose you, he's ridding you of any hypocrisy. God would not do that if you were an outcast. There'd be no way your life would go, th you, you go through what you're going through. You're going through these things because you're being purified by the Most High. We, uh, God is getting rid of the hypocrisy. See, remember in the scriptures, hypocrites go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if we don't have the wherewithal to maintain righteousness, we probably won't end up in the kingdom of God. Every time we choose darkness, we're saying no to Christ. We are rejecting his sacrifice. He died that we may be forgiven of our sins. He did not die to excuse the sin we continued to indulge in. 
Do you see that? So you're still under a process. That's a, that's a gift to be under that process. It's a gift to still be alive in this process. Because if you would have died, you wouldn't have gone to be with him. You die before this process is complete. How can you go to be with him? We, I can't go to be with the Lord if I'm a hypocrite. If I'm professing to be righteous, but I'm choosing unrighteousness, I cannot go to be with the Lord because that's hypocrisy. Now, that's what the Lord is doing, getting this hypocrisy out of us. Do you see it? Do you all see it now? Now, in this transition of ridding us of hypocrisy, of ridding us of the darkness we choose, this is where the doctrines pop up. Oh, boy. This is where the doctrines come. See, there's a, there's almost this person inside of you who has an insatiable desire to be right. The same person that chose the darkness is the same person that wants to be right. And it fights humility. And it rises when it shouldn't. And the Lord's going to put that old person to rest. Do you hear me? He already knows your heart's intention. And he's going to walk you through this process to totally get rid of that old person within you. Do you see that? These doctrines that people raise, they're divisive for a reason. Because they're authored not by holiness, but by that character that the Lord is getting rid of. That the same character that chooses darkness, the same character that excuses the flesh, is the same character that will cling to doctrine to justify itself. That's why no good comes of the conversations dealing with certain doctrines, because they are not authored from the righteous source. You know what that means? That means the content, you can, the content could be holy, but because it was born out of justification of self, the fruit of it is going to be evil. You see that? In fact, isn't that how Satan works? He takes what is divine and holy, causes people to hold it in a very strange way. He causes people to use it to crush others, thus perverting righteousness, weaponizing righteousness. Is that what he attempts to do? He tries to pervert everything that belongs to the living God that is pure, that is righteous. He perverts everything. And so his conversations that he influences, they end up being doctrines people carry with a twist. Because there's nothing wrong with a person believing in the scripture. Because when the, when the Bible says that those who are alive that they will eventually meet the Lord in the air. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with the doctrine is the forcefulness of it. The presentation is all crooked because people will say, if you don't believe in the pre-trib, you're fake or something like that. What would ever motivate that statement? Not your father in heaven. Because we were sinners and he still did not accuse us to the point of death. We were crooked and did every evil under the sun, and he did nothing less than love us and still give his only begotten son. So we know that our father never speaks like that, and he does not treat us like that. So it's not within him nor his righteousness to have that type of activity go on. No, that's born of a different source. See that? That's born of a different source. We were wicked. The world was wicked. And what did God do? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And what did Jesus say? I didn't come to the world to condemn it. I did not. But to save it, I came into the world. You see that? And when you have a person with these conversations, and all they seek to do is cause people to choose a side, we know that does not come from the Most High. Because the Lord does not work that way. Satan manipulates God's word. He'll take the truth and turn it into a weapon against Christians. See, because a person who is not a Christian is not going to have that conversation. I want you guys to think of something. When you thought about the rapture, you were filled full of hope. But then almost immediately, you were introduced into the argument about the rapture. Did you notice? And instantly, when you saw that, 
there was a mechanism inside you that said, I have to choose a side. It was almost like somebody was forcing you on a side. And you were just a bystander. But something was pulling you to join a side, to be for or against it. And indeed, it's two sides. A very sneaky element was pulling you, wasn't it? You knew you had to be on one side or the other. But see, here's the thing. How come nobody ever identifies that little piece I just mentioned? It lets you know who set the whole thing up. Because our father does not take sides. He is no respecter of persons. He stands for his word and his truth. He loves his creation. And he seeks to have his creation continue to be his creation. And to elevate them. Satan, he's the one that authored all that evil, all the darkness, all the arguments, and the pain and hurt that comes with those conversations. All you have to do is listen. And all you have to do is understand yourself. And you'll see where he works. See, I know with me, I can understand darkness so well because I understand my own flesh. I only need to look inwardly at what this flesh wants, what it cried for and desired, what it did at the height of its existence. I know it for what it is, and I'll never sit in denial of it. And because of that, it's very easy to spot the same thing in somebody else. And it's very easy to know the origin by way of education in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, which is Satan himself. And then that term, here comes that term. Somebody will say, well, you do, do you believe in this or do you believe in that? You know what my answer is? I'll tell them I believe in Christ. Well, don't you believe in the so-and-so? I believe in Christ. I believe in Jesus of Nazareth. And they get angry. Quite strange in it. So I don't let the vice of subjects like that become a part of me. I know where they come from. But even that, the Lord allows. You've seen the process of your life, right? All of you should see that quite clearly now. What does it all lead up to? It leads up to you being like those who love not their lives unto death. It grants you experience and wisdom in, in truly comprehending that God gave a way of escape out of a sinful situation to those who desire to be totally delivered from sin. There is a way of escape. Anything. You're trapped in. There is a way of escape by way of the Messiah. You never have to escape the rule of Christ. When the earth endures, fires, floods, storm, and tempest. And we know that by way of the word, it is Christ who unleashes this. Why would you have to escape something your Lord and Savior is unleashing? He's not unleashing it to damage you. No. And you know that scripture where it says it rains on the just as well as the unjust? And what that means is, listen, once you're committed, you're not going to be blind when these things come. Right now, most of you have a general idea of what's coming up on the earth. And there are certain areas when you see certain things, you're going to make a move. You're not just going to sit there. You're going to be guided. This step after hum uh, uh, humility is added into you and hypocrisy is taken out, trust is formed. When you trust the Lord, you don't question the Lord anymore. You just don't, you don't question him. Isn't that funny? Once that process is done, then you accept what he says. Once you accept what he says, he'll move you into places you never thought possible. See, if you question the Lord, how can you move in his timing? You can't, can you? You can't do it. You can't move in God's timing. If he would say, go left, and you would say, well, wait a minute, why do you want me to go left and not right? You'd mess up the whole process. We have examples like that in the Word of God. Once your trust is built with the Lord through your refinement and growth of spirit, the one thing you'll never be in a rush for is to escape. You will have your mind on finishing the race, not escaping, because you have understanding that the Lord can break the seven seals and nobody else can. So then it's the Lord doing these things on the earth, unleashing them. And if he does that, he's doing it for us. It is our final deliverance. I'm going to ask you something before the break. Do you really think that the seven seals are broken to break you down? Those of you who believe in Christ, do you really think Jesus would break the seven seals to destroy you? Because listen, if you have it in your mind that somehow you got to find your way out. Then you're not trusting in the Messiah's timing, nor the Messiah's judgment in the breaking of the seals. 
You're not trusting in his deliverance because you're nervous whether you're going to be here or not in the midst of suffering. People are scared to death. They're frightened because they think they're going to have to go through something again. Remember that. You never have to escape what the Lord brings because what he brings is absolutely for your deliverance. But if you get this escapist mentality, then you'll follow Christ closer to get something out of him. But we know what that is. That's almost like usury. As for me, I trust this timing. If the Lord had me here, listen, I'm always prepared to go all the way. That's why I don't have surprises in life. Because I will never tell myself, well, this or that will never happen. I'm not one of those people. All that's up to the Messiah. I don't speak like that. I've always prepared for the long haul. My primary focus is on finishing the race, never escaping. That's why I never talk about the pre-trip, post-trip, and all these other trips that they have. I know where they come from. I already did the history search on that stuff back in the 80s, where it comes from, the bios of the individual who invented this stuff and those who pushed it. Was it based on truth? Yes, it was. But it was also shuffled up to favor and for a useful tactic in the churches they were involved with. It was useful. And some people came up with more things and it was flat out rejected. Let me give you guys one more example. How would a person not be saved by Christ if they believe the earth is round? Why is it that this flat earth, rounder thing is only divisive among those who believe in Christ? And when I say divisive, I mean real enemies are made based upon that belief, whether it is or is not. Why is the Christian form the place where this conversation arises all the time? How did it find its way to the fellowship among Christians? I'll tell you why. It's a weapon. A person went up in a balloon, one of those big proponents of the flat earth, and he shared his findings, and he quit, you know, talking to people like he was talking to people. The truth is, once people go and inspect it for themselves, they quit talking about the subject altogether. And if a person truly believes in Christ, it does not matter. I don't care if it's square. You guys got to be careful of these devil agendas out there you're going to believe in a whole host of theories and why so many theories in this day and age so that you're not following christ you'll be disputing all of your sisters and your brothers brother against brother that's what that will be when you pick up anything from the world the only thing you can do with that is argue to your brothers and sisters about a causing division because when you have a topic you talk about those who are young may agree with it, some may disagree, but they end up fighting. And if you use that word believe, you just made it. You just made it a conversation for believers. And believers end up bashing each other to pieces over a subject that has nothing to do with salvation. It's just like if somebody said, Mike, do you think the stone they rolled away from Jesus' tomb, do you think that was square or round? I'd say, I don't care what it was. But it was moved out of the way, wasn't it? I don't care what it was. The point was, Christ came out of that tomb. That was the point. Not if the rock was round or square. That was not the point. Do you see how it works? Some One of those same people would say, what do you believe? That the cross was, you know, two feet in the ground or eight feet in the ground. Who cares? It's the cross. And the act at the cross was finished. Thank you, Lord. It's almost like people are excited to go to heaven if they're not talking about Christ. They're so excited to escape everything that happens that they would discard everything of today and argue with their brothers and sisters about Christ. I am by no means like that. My daily enjoyment and blessing is to be able to do something for Christ because he did everything for me. Why would I want to escape when he's with me daily? Why would I have a mindset like that? And how could it be a divisive subject for me when I know what's written in the word of God? I know what's in there. Right? But I will never be the one who would let go of the hand of Christ just to run into eternity because that's what I wanted the entire time was to just be in some sort of safety and use Christ for your deliverance. And everything in his word is going to happen according to his timing, not man's timing. But can you imagine or perceive the heart of the Father of those out there who are pushing an idea and will indeed cause Division over that idea. A person that would say, do you believe in the pre-trib? And if you don't believe in it the way they believe in it, they get angry. 
How can the Father be in that? It's important that each person believe in the way that the Lord has given them to believe. Don't believe the way I believe. Believe an authentic way that the Lord has shown you. And remember that. Because I can only imagine the heart of the Father looking at the truth of us, knowing that certain people on this earth are only excited and only follow Christ because they believe that Christ will get them out of all their troubles and they're not seeing the truth that they have to go through a process. This is why I was explaining part of the process, the process that we go through, the trials, the tribulations. Hopefully you guys have a better understanding of it. But when you read the scriptures in context, try not to separate the scriptures, but read the whole thing in, the, in context. Everything you're going through, it is never absent, the Messiah. Everything you're going through is to grow you. It's part of the process. It is to really grant to us attributes of meekness and humility and power and authority that we walk in truth not a lie that we're not spoiled by the traditions of men that are lifted up in god's love by way of truth always the last thing here i want to know from you guys can you reflect back on your life and i believe everybody at some point got excited about the lord coming back to get them to the point where they would go back and start counting the days right that uh, how many days it's going to take for the Lord to come and get us. But I want you to notice something. When you were counting those days, when you got excited, and the Lord did not come, and you had to go through more trials and tribulations, what type of person did you become? Seriously. Many people have partially broken hearts because the Lord has not come yet. Many people have done that. The Lord never gave us a doctrine that would do that to us. He never gave us a word. That will cause us to be heartbroken every day we're here on this earth. Of all things, Christ encouraged us to be an encouragement to others and to be encouraged ourselves. He does not give you something you can be heartbroken over. He does not do that. Everything Satan gives will burn your hands. Everything he gives will start to break you. It'll bring you down. It'll put you into depression. What the Lord gives is for today. And a lot of people are disappointed with today because they've been believing in something not real. See, if a person says, now listen to the logic. If you think or if you thought that the Lord was coming to get you and he didn't get you yet, you did not believe the truth, did you? Just think about it. You didn't believe the truth. And if a lot of people are disappointed right now, this very day where things are breaking out, they're disappointed because they thought they would be gone. The truth is, we were not believing the truth. We were believing something else. And when you believe something that is not the truth, you're going to be disappointed. You can potentially be depressed. Why? Because it's not bound in righteousness. It's not bound in righteousness. God doesn't give any of us anything like that. In fact, he told us. If he said no man knows the day nor the hour, then why is it that people are continuing to say Jesus is coming back on such and such day? And these are the same people that have outbursts, that get angry, that disappear and withdraw from everybody because they're upset something didn't work out the way they calculated. Why do they continue to do that? If you have a relationship with Christ, you don't have to escape a thing. If you're a child of the living God, why would you have to escape off his earth to go anywhere? Do you see what happens? That's a corruption. The very thing Satan does is he will sow seeds that are partially truth mixed with deceitful lies. And he'll cause corruption that way. And then you're not at your full potential. But as part of the process, nobody can ever be broken of this until they're hurt by this. So you can be lifted back up in truth. I think that a lot of people have fallen for that from time to time. When we should have just left it alone. They say, Lord, I know you'll come get me when you get me. But some people, every two months, some of the same people are saying he's coming to get us. The date fails, they say it again. People get excited again, nothing happens. It happens again and again and again and again. And people don't understand why something is fighting their own faith. I never think about that. You know why? I trust the Messiah. I trust his decisions. I trust his timing. I trust his guidance. And I leave all things in his hands. See, I don't have that burden of trying to figure out anything. He didn't put us here to solve 
the gospel. He put us here to spread the gospel. It's not something you solve. It's something you spread. It's something you live by. Eternal life is granted by us no longer being sinners, but actually joining the family of the living God through Christ. That's how we're joined heirs. It's through Christ by his example. And our process brings us closer to being that individual we are predestined to be. So why would anybody fear what's coming when it's our Savior, our King, who initiates it? When God the Father governs it, the beast cannot rise until God says so. The ten kings, they only do what they do because God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. So all this stuff is by the living God. Those things that come out of the bottomless pit are commanded not to touch any green thing or any, anybody with the seal of God in their foreheads, but only torment those who evidently did not accept Christ, who stood against the Father. Not you, and the 144,000 are sealed, and they were frightened during that time because they had to see it. They had to be sealed so they could be kept, so they wouldn't be touched. Those things that come out of the bottomless pit, they don't do whatever they want to do. They're going to do exactly what God permits them to do, and they will do nothing more than that. All of that is not to get you. People are just frightened of suffering. That's why I addressed suffering at the beginning of this talk so that you would understand why you suffered. There's a reason you went through what you went through. It's part of God's process. In order for you to have the truth, you have to be exposed to darkness and light. To understand what you went through, you have to, you, you have to be immersed and you have to be a partaker of darkness and light. That's how darkness touched you. After that happens, you make a choice. You cannot make a choice until you know the truth about darkness and light. Then you make a choice. And when you make that choice, that choice is going to be qualified. And you're going to be humbled because most people make that choice and they have good intentions, but they have no power to fulfill that choice. They keep slipping back into one area or the other. We sit in denial, but then God over time breaks us of that denial because he causes us to have to come out and say, well, this is the way it is. Yes, I did stumble and fall. And yes, I, I chose darkness. I did this. Because if he didn't do that, we would sit as hypocrites, deny our passions, these things of darkness that we do like and choose sometimes, never confessing the truth. That's a hypocrite. And we could not step foot to the kingdom of God. So the Lord has further situations that happen. And he bestows upon us humility and meekness. We don't just act like we're humble and meek. No, we're put in position where we become humble. He humbles us, where we become meek. Then we begin to grow. Others come into our lives by way of relationships, and we can actually grow by their experiences at that point. You cannot grow by somebody else's experience until you know the difference between darkness and light, until you have been immersed in darkness and light, until you make your own choice. Then you can share in somebody else's plight, their walk of life. And you will grow from that further. There are more steps to this process. A process that can be understood from start to finish. Because trust and confidence, that's what's being yielded now. It'll be developed. You'll become one of those who love not their lives unto death. That means you'll have full confidence and faith in the Messiah. And when a person says, well, aren't you afraid? Don't you want to escape? You'll say God's will be done. And you'll go right back to the gospel with massive sincerity. You'll be of actual help to those around you. You'll be the steadfast one when everybody else gives up and runs out. You will not run. You won't hide. You don't need to escape. The Lord teaches us to face everything. And he's taking us through a process where we will truly be joint heirs with Christ. We will truly be family of the Most High. And you will face off everything that would ever confront you. And you would overcome it. God never teaches us how to run away. Do you know that? He always told us what we would face. He always told us what we would face. These divisive subjects, ladies and gentlemen, the root of these divisive subjects, which is a truth mixed with man-made things, it causes a war of faith, even in the body of Christ. For yourselves, based on your understanding, Believe what the Lord is giving you to believe, but walk forward with faith knowing you're in a process 
and never let Satan take God's truth and weaponize it in you. Remember the words of Christ. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And if you're upset and tired, it's a good moment to admit that all too often we get tired because our way, what we thought would happen, was it going to work out and above all things. How do you know if you've been believing a lie? When you thought something would take place and it did not. Please remember that. Every time I thought something would take place and it didn't and I get upset, the truth is I, was, I believed a lie. It wasn't truth. We get upset when we believe falsehoods. We don't get upset from the truth. We get upset from the lies. Let the Lord's timing be of his own divine nature. Trust his timing. Trust his decisions. Because when men are calculating times, how is that trusting of the Most High? How is that? We're trying to precede him. We're trying to get him to do something on a date that we choose. Or we're outright trying to fool everybody else. It's very easy to get caught up in a situation to get happy and to start naming things we shouldn't. Yes, that means when people get happy, when people get encouraged, they can go too far and their old nature can surface. Don't ever think that your old nature cannot surface in a moment of happiness because it can. But the Lord gives us joy eternal. Joy is never absent God's love nor his peace. It is always bound within his sobriety and his righteousness. So it won't utter, it won't cause a person to utter a lie. In fact, the joy that the Lord gives will cause you to utter all the stumbling blocks of your life and how you stumbled into things. And you'll encourage other people through your own failures. How powerful is that? That's what the joy of the Lord will do. You won't be afraid to tell somebody you messed up and messed up royally. And then when you share that with them, they're going to be encouraged. They're going to say, wow, that person just admitted that to me. I don't have to lie either. Do you know that frees people? I had a, a, a somebody close to me. They kept every time they get a phone call, they wouldn't answer the phone. And I told them one day, I said, do you know what you're doing? They said, well, those people call all the time. And I said, but, but these are collectors, right? Like, yeah, I don't want to answer that. I said, well, answer it. Because what you're doing is deceiving them. And then you're putting pressures on yourself. You're inviting darkness into your life. I said, answer the phone and tell them the truth and watch the Lord work. That's precisely what this person did to all of them. They could, after the first one, they couldn't help it. They did it to all of them. Now they don't have that problem. They didn't dodge the phone calls. They started facing everything. This person started facing everything. And every aspect of their life that they faced was touched by the Lord. See, when you face things like that, you know what you're doing? You're inviting your father to come into your life. See, when you hide something, if a child takes a piece of candy and they put it in their pocket, they're not eating it, they're concealing it. And if something is concealed, it's on the person. When you conceal something, you're keeping it. Do you see that? So if you've got a problem and you've concealed that problem, you're actually keeping that problem. And you're going to have it for a long time so long as it's concealed. The moment you stop concealing it and you say, yep, this is me. Look what I did. I did this. I did this. And you tell the truth. You're not concealing it. The moment you don't conceal it is the moment God does something about it. Do you know that? But if you put it in your pocket, the Lord won't do anything because by your actions, you have said no to the Most High. You said, don't nobody touch it. And haven't you noticed that the Lord, he's allowing you to make your own decisions. He's allowing you to make up your own mind. He'll never force righteousness upon you. But I'll tell you something. You pull that thing out, don't conceal it anymore. And you say, this is where I'm messing up. And while everybody's shocked, God won't be. He's going to be pleased, and something can be done about that issue, that problem. You don't have to conceal it. Break it on out. You don't have to tell everybody. Just pull it out. Because you know if you conceal it from everybody, you're not going to show it to God either. I hope you know that. You're not going to confess it to the Most High when you're hiding it from everybody else. How many of you, many of you still smoke cigarettes, right? But you get around Christians and you won't smoke cigarettes, but you want to stop smoking cigarettes. So I have a, have some advice. 
tell the Lord, Lord, th th these cigarettes, I love them. I can't do it. I, I can't do it by myself, Lord. I still like to smoke. Tell them the truth. Don't sit there and say, Lord, just re to, um, uh, relieve me or heal me of this addiction to cigarettes. Stop saying that. Say, Lord, I like to smoke. Tell them the truth. And in that truth, you're going to find your father. The father will always be found in his righteousness. So tell him the truth. If you're drinking and you like to drink, then tell him. Don't dodge it. Don't beat around the bush. Present things as they are in truth. No hypocrisy. God doesn't work in hypocrisy. Present it. That's when you'll find out he is indeed supernatural. That's when your confidence boost will come. That's when he'll work through you things you never thought possible. And then you'll be one of those to say, somebody will come around and say, well, I don't think God will do that. And you'll say, hold up, brother. Yes, he will. Oh, yes, he don't say he won't because he will. You just haven't experienced that yet. He most That's when you become encouraging. That's when a person, the person, they could be of high stature in the church. They may lose faith. They may come to you and say, you know, I just didn't. I knew such and such wasn't real. They say, you say, what's wrong with you? It's OK. All of us get discouraged, but he's real. Well, I just don't think he'll do it. Oh, yes, he will. He'll do it. He'll more than do it. See, that's when you have faith beyond all of your peers. That's when no one can tamper with your faith again. Once you are delivered by the Most High, you can't be tampered with again. Some of you just need to be delivered by the Most High. That's all. You know what the Lord said? He says, seek ye first kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. All these things we added to you. He also said something else, that when you seek him, then he'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, if it's a desire of your heart to stop doing certain things, seek him first in it. Do it his way. Have no hypocrisy near you. Because the Lord said hypocrites go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Get rid of hypocrisy. Don't approach him in hypocrisy. Tell him the truth. Stop formulating your prayers to sound good. And tell him the truth. Lord, I'm stuck like Chuck. He already knows. He already knows. But you're not presenting it. And he gave you the power of choice. You've got to choose to be delivered. Some of you, you can't be delivered because you cannot tell the truth of your situation. You're not at the point yet where you see the damage of that situation because it's still embarrassing. You don't want to face the embarrassment. But don't worry. All you have to do is go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I'm frightened to death of embarrassment. Tell him the truth so he can put you where you ought to be. Tell him the truth. Tell the Lord the truth. Don't hide it. If you're embarrassed, if you think it's going to cost you everything, this, that, and the other, then tell him. Don't hide it. Don't conceal it. Because if you conceal it, you're doing what? You're keeping it. If it's concealed, you're keeping it. If a child puts the candy in his pocket, he's keeping the candy. Bring it out in the open to the Most High. That's the first one you need to be open with. When you're open with the Most High, the nature of your prayers will change hypocrisy will be gone. See, because if I hide something and I'm praying, but I'm still hiding it, that's a prayer with hypocrisy. If I downplay what's actually going on inside of me, if I'm really addicted to something and I just tell the well, Lord, just deliver me, Lord, from this so-and-so. I know that you can do it. Just help me out. No, that's not, that's not disclosing the entirety of that thing to the most high. Because in that prayer, because you won't confess the certain parts of it, you know what will happen? All of it won't be taken care of. You're still concealing portions of it. What if God heals you of the addiction? You may still have the desire. Do you know that? He can fix and heal your body. But you may go right back out into the world, corrupt yourself in something even worse. But when you present it all and say, Lord, I can't talk to people. This is why I'm doing this. I can't be around people, so I need this. This is, I can't even deal with people without this. If you think you have a nervous condition, why, why am I seeing that? It's somebody, more than somebody, some of you, you cannot deal with people unless you have something. And it's even a handicap to you. It's a handicap to you. So tell them, admit to them that you like it, that you think it helps you. Tell them the truth of the whole situation. And if you want help, then tell them the truth. I want help. I don't know what decision to make. Tell them you don't think you can do it. Tell them you don't have the strength because you still like it. Tell them the truth. Put those angels to work around you. Open that door to the Most High that he may work in your life. Tell them you're a jealous person. And that's why you rage and rave. Tell them you have suspicions that you can't get out of your mind. 
Stop telling him, Lord, just show me the truth of what this person's doing. Show me that so I can go ahead and make my decision. Stop saying that. Seek to be healed of the brokenness that's causing you to be suspicious. See, if a person, let me tell you guys something. If you're with a person and you love that person, you're going to want that person to be elevated. You're going to want that person to be healed. You do not want that person to be a slave. So when you love that person, you're also going to love that person's freedom of choice. If you lord over a person in an attempt to stop them from doing something or corrupting or making you lose something, what are you actually doing? You're holding somebody prisoner. And then if you pray that the Lord give you intel on that person, you're praying that the Lord help you keep that person imprisoned. And I'm telling you right now, that's not the way. That is not the way. That's not how you start it. You see how easy darkness can work itself into your life? This concealment thing that we do, it doesn't work. It causes a situation that should have been a trial that lasted two weeks to maintain itself for 20 years. Be delivered and seek deliverance by not concealing, having no hypocrisy, telling the Lord the truth, that's all. You have an opportunity to truly walk with Christ, truly have a bestowment, to be the very individuals in your heart to be. You have that opportunity, but it's up to you to choose it. That's up to you. That's why doctrines here in this place are no good, lest it be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he had doctrine, if I have a doctrine, one of those bold doctrines, and make you all agree with my doctrine, then that means I'm not going to hear what the Lord has given you. I want you guys to be authentic. I can tell you right now, I don't know everything. I don't know too much. And it's important to me to hear something authentic from you all. That's important to me. That's called fellowship. This is not some dictatorship. There should be no Hitler preachers anywhere, but there are. And in our freedom, we do choose or don't choose, don't we? He didn't force anything. He educates us. He gives us opportunities. He's granted us mercy and grace. We continue despite what we've done. See how good the Lord is. That's what you pass along to everybody else. It shouldn't be a dictatorship. And her sister threw right didn't like that comment. No, I don't think they did either. Well, it's the truth. That's what it is. Is it? Is it not? Is it not? Isn't that what people see? Isn't that what some of you saw? And you said, wait a minute, I can't be a part of that. Did your eyes not open to something that was wrong all over the face of the earth like it hit you like a hammer? Didn't it? And you started to see things from people and recognize, who do you think allowed you to see those things? God didn't allow you to see that so you could criticize everything. No, he showed you the truth of what was taking place so that you would not be absorbed by it. You know what a dictatorship is. You've seen them in action. And if you don't go along with that dictatorship, you will be excommunicated. That need not be in any place of fellowship, especially when we lift up the name of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth. Because the title was rapture or no rapture. Then do you see how the mind should not be on that, but on Christ? Because I wonder how the heart of the Father is with people who only follow him to escape. And when they get to their destination, like kids do, they get to Disney World. They don't enjoy the trip with the parents. They suffer the parents to get to Disney World. And when they get to Disney World, they're ready to run off without the parents. That same situation is happening in this world when people are taking things out of context. And they won't trust Christ with his own timing and the Father with his own timing. They're doing the same thing. They're complying with things to escape the danger they perceive coming. I, for one, am not. I trust the Lord's direction for my life. He will lead me by the still waters. He's not going to lead me to Niagara Falls and push me over the cliff. That's not what he's going to do. He already told us what he will do. But what heart is it? That would put the event before the Savior. Who would put the event of the Savior before the Savior? Who would ask somebody again, do they? Do you believe in Noah's flood? That has nothing to do with salvation. By the way, I don't believe in Noah's flood. I believe that there was a flood. But I don't believe in Noah's flood because I can't believe in it. It doesn't, it, it, it's not preaching to me. Jesus is preaching to me. I believe in Christ Jesus. Do you see what Satan does? And you have a lot of people going around saying, do you believe in the pre-trip? No, I believe in Christ. Do you believe in the post-trip? No, I believe in Christ. Do you believe in the trip? No, I believe in Christ. And I believe that 
at a time coming, those who are alive who meet the Lord in the air. That's what I believe. I believe what the Word says. I do not believe man's timings. How many dates are going to have to be set before somebody actually says, wait, what am I doing? Every year, I'm getting my hopes up about this when I should every day be rejoicing that the Lord gave me another opportunity. You get your hopes up on something in the future, you're going to miss the opportunity today. I think Christ now, not the future. I need not escape my Father's world. What did Jesus write? The tares are going to be gathered up first. Not you, the tares. They're going to be gathered up first. See, you can't even justify that once you start thinking in these other ways. And how many generations have to set a date and ruin lives before we stop doing that? I don't care about dates either. Because I trust, I trust the leading of the Lord. I don't care about dates. That's why when people ask me, what do you think that will happen? In my, in my mind, I'm saying it doesn't matter. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. And I trust the Most High. Don't fall for the divisive subjects, guys. Believe in the Word. Don't let Satan make you focus on an event and then have you follow Christ and conform to righteousness just for that event. But rather believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus of Nazareth, the only begotten Son of the living God who died on the cross to save us from our sins. Believe in Him, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Be thankful for that relationship on a daily basis as much as possible. And let no one cause division among you by believing in an event or not. These are specifics not given to mankind yet. And everybody who's ever set a date has lied because they've been wrong. Therefore, they have lied. They have lied about an event God has reserved unto himself. We fall for it when we see the dangers in the world. We fall for it when we have messed up things in our lives. My advice is experience the salvation and deliverance of the Lord. He is a supernatural father who will do supernatural things in your life. All you have to do is throw hypocrisy away and take things out of your pot. Stop concealing things. You know why I'm so tough on concealing things? When I was young, I did that all the time. I used to get, I, I was very upset one time because something wasn't fixed. Do you know how hard-headed I was? I wanted it my way. All of that I gave up. I don't want anything my way. Nothing. Zip zero. I don't want to be right in a conversation or an argument. I do not. Because the Lord is already right. And my confidence and trust is in Him. That's why my joy cannot be breached. It can't be robbed or stolen. It can't be altered. It doesn't matter what happens in my life. Because whatever happens in my life, I trust the Messiah raising me. See, when I found out the Lord is raising me, that changed everything. I need not escape the godly process the Lord has me endure. He that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. We may not understand what he's doing, but what he is doing, he's doing for us, not against us. Everything that comes from Revelation is for the ultimate deliverance of the children. It is for the judgment of the wicked. Why would you ever be afraid of the end time? And the Lord said he would protect the elect. We hide ourselves in him. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? In him, to, to hide yourself in the Lord means you are fully trusting him. Means you agree with him. Therefore, you can choose him. So when the Lord sends a calamity upon the earth, it'll be like the death angel in Egypt. Did you forget about that story? How it went over one door that had the lamb's blood. See, do you have the blood of the lamb on you? That happens by way of your faith. If you believe in Christ Jesus for real, your death angel will pass over you. It's going to pass over you. I know that by way of truth, because you should be dead already. You have no idea what has been the plans that have been hatched, that were set forth, and it didn't work. How about the solar flare right after 2012? Three solar flares head towards Earth. Three solar flares at the last minute. They were headed directly for Earth. Three Carrington events back to back were supposed to happen and something out there deflected at the last minute. 
Did you guys know that happened in July? I believe it was July. What what day was it? It was in July. Three CMEs headed towards Earth. They were going to devastate us. That's when I was held for access. And, and many of us could not move around. We had to stay put for, for it was like four days. That's when movement orders were given. That's when the world rearranged and nobody ever knew it. The whole world had rearranged and nobody ever knew it. That's when they blew the big gaps in the underground bases and people started seeing smoke come up from the desert floor. It wasn't smoke that was them blowing the big gaps. That's when everybody was about to go in because it was about to be done for the earth. And then at the last minute, when they were right between the moon and the earth, and it was right there spanning out, something out there deflected that just enough so the earth would not be hit. And guess what? No one has an answer for that. Everybody who witnessed that, everybody who poured over the data, they could not believe that happened. Everybody except those who seek to save their own skins. There are so many things people don't know about. You should be dead. I should be dead. But the Lord said, not today. That's why you're here. Because your father said, not today. And why does he give us another day? Because he does not desire that we be castaways. We have another day so we don't have to be those who are separated from his love. Remember that. We're not given another day because we deserve it. We're not given another day so we can have fun in it. We're given another day because the Lord has hope in us that we will choose him. He's not going to force us. So you know what that means? That means God has faith in you. That's what it means. That means your Father in Heaven has faith in you. That you'll eventually choose righteousness in all things. And if He has faith in you, then He's hoping for you to choose righteousness. And He's extended the days so that happens. That's why it's written, God is not slack concerning His promises, as men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us, desiring that nobody, He desires that nobody perishes outside of Him. So then we live in another day because of his love for you. So if you're alive today, that's evidence of God's love upon you. No matter what you're doing, no matter what you have done, that's God's love directed towards you.